Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining me for this view on Africa, to those online and to those also in the room here with me today. I'm Kira O'Coin, and I'm a researcher on the ENACT team here at ISS. ENACT, which stands for Enhancing Africa's Response to Transnational Organized Crime, is a new EU-funded multi-year project here in the ISS. Um, we're, ISS is leading this in partnership with Interpol and the Global Initiative Against Organized Crime. Today, I'm here to talk to you today about a new research component within an act, specifically the TOC Incident Monitoring Project, um, the report of which will be published um, in the next week or so, and we're having a launch event on the 21st of September here in Pretoria. First, I'll talk a bit about the project, both its concept and methodology, then touch on some of the most interesting findings, the limitations, and then lastly, some early policy implications that we can take from this research. To start, my background is not in um, wildlife conservation or even criminology, it's in conflict data and, and political analysis. So that might lend you to ask why, what does data analysis have to do with wildlife crime? Um, well, this research that I'm sharing with you today is a powerful example of how we can use media monitoring to learn new things about wildlife crime in Southern Africa and then to apply that to other crimes elsewhere. Like how often are wildlife crimes violent? Where often are police involved in reporting? Um, how do we know about the rural border crimes, considering that most media are, are concentrated in major cities? The ENACT TOC Incident Monitoring Project, and here and throughout, TOC refers to transnational organized crime, uh, takes a point of departure of some of the leading conflict data projects, such as ACLID and GTD, focus on incidents. And when I say incidents, I mean a single event or activity, and in the case of conflict analysis, two armed actors fighting for a political objective. Um, these conflict data projects, largely using media, record specific details about conflict incidents, such as the type of altercation, so was it a battle, a riot, or an IED explosive, um, location, was it in a town, village, or airport, date, and the actors involved, militias or government, etc. These sources of data help conflict researchers get a more nuanced understanding of complex conflicts, and the motivation behind this project is to bring the same micro-level focus to organized crime. Just like conflict data project the, project, the TOC incident monitoring relies on human coding, or in this case, um, a team of dedicated uh, researchers that we have sourced from the University of Pretoria. They source articles using a specialized media monitoring platform and a uniform keyword search. In a nutshell, we turn media articles into data points. This pilot phase covered 10 countries in Africa's southern region from the period 2000 to 2016, and we focused on incidents of wildlife crime exclusively, mainly the poaching, smuggling of possessions of protected species. The countries of focus were Angola, Botswana, Namibia, Lesotho, Malawi, Mozambique, South Africa, Swaziland, Zimbabwe, and Zambia. We're now using the same kind of monitoring and to examine other forms of crime in other regions of Africa, and I'll talk a bit more about that at the end. So why did we choose wildlife crime for the pilot phase? Firstly, it's a grave challenge to the region, as we're all aware. Um, wildlife crime is said to be the fourth most lucrative crime globally. Um, it's also one of the most expensive security challenges that the region faces. And lastly, it receives a wide degree of media attention. Now, what we know about um, the scale of wildlife crime in Southern Africa rests on available data at just two points on the crime spectrum, the poaching of the incident and the smuggling or the illegal trading incidents. Park rangers and police typically report on poaching incidents, but only routinely in South Africa and a more ad hoc basis elsewhere. And even then, there's only data on rhinos and elephants. Seizure data, on the other hand, comes from reports from customs offices and border police, but these data are limited in what they tell us about the scale of the problem for a number of reasons that we can get into in the discussion. That said, using the available data, we can come to know a couple of key things. Firstly, we know that since around 2008-2009, there's been a near tripling of the number of poaching, rhino poaching incidents in Southern Africa, with South Africa shouldering the biggest burden. See the graph on the left-hand side here that shows the total rhino poaching globally and South Africa's dominance. We also know that most seizures of rhino horn globally have occurred in South Africa, China, Vietnam, and Mozambique, meaning we have evidence linking the demand countries, China and Vietnam, and the supply countries, South Africa and Mozambique. And the graph on the right demonstrates this. However, we can only get so much from these statistics on the nature of organized crime, and by we here I mean collectively the group of anti-poaching wildlife conservationists. 
What about the people or groups carrying out these crimes? How do we know about the actors? How do they operate? Do they work in other illicit markets such as narco narcotics and arms trafficking? What about the response from states? Why, who do poachers and smugglers face most frequently at the front line? Is, it violent, uh, is there violence against poachers? If so, where? This is where our new research comes in. What, what remains understudied is the demand side market driving the uptick, how poachers are recruited and armed, how the smuggling networks operate, and the extent of overlap between groups and the products they work within. It is hoped that as this project develops, because as I mentioned, this was a pilot phase, the findings can help shed light on some of these more difficult aspects to measure. Now, so what have we been able to find out that we didn't know before? First, let's start um, with the basics. Between 2000 and 2016, we recorded about 1,035 incidents involving at least one of the 10 countries. The map here shows the dominance of poaching activities in South Africa's northeastern provinces, Zimbabwe, and along the corridor between northern Botswana, southern Zambia, and Zimbabwe. What it doesn't show are the large number of smuggling incidents we recorded in Mozambique, China, Vietnam, Singapore, and Hong Kong. South Africa hosted the most incidents, followed by Zimbabwe and Namibia. Twenty different other countries from four continents were also involved. China, Hong Kong, and Vietnam topped the list of non-African destination countries for wildlife products. Most reported incidents occurred in 20, 2016, followed by 2015 and 2013. We can also see what kinds of weapons were used in the incidents. The most common weapons used were firearms, using hunt, usually hunting rifles. There were, however, a number of cases involving the use of cyanide poisoning in Zimbabwe, specifically in Huangay National Park. Of the eight actor types the project analyzed, individuals were the most frequent primary actor, followed by groups, associations, and syndicates. In just 5% of incidents involved the police, customs official, or other government official as a perpetrating actor, meaning it's rarely the case that media seems to cover instances where police or government officials are involved. And this may indicate a gap in media reporting given that we know that corruption is a grave challenge in the region. The top five commonly legally possessed poached or smuggled species in the region were, in descending order, rhino horn, elephant tusk, abalone, pangolin, and big cats. Incidents where one or more species types were mixed in packaging or otherwise was the third most popular after rhino and elephant. On the map here, we can see that rhino dominates in South Africa and Namibia, abalone in the Western Cape of South Africa, and elephant in that Botswana, Zimbabwe, Zambia corridor. This kind of study also gives us an indication of how organized crime is associated with certain types of products. The animal product most likely to be associated with an organized crime group or syndicate was rhino, followed by abalone. Poaching and trading in abalone was most associated with drug trafficking, particularly methamphetamine, or tick as it's known in South Africa, more than any other species, meaning the actors involved, as well as the shipments, um, were more likely in the end of their product to be found alongside legal drugs. A very interesting variable that we monitored was how states respond. State responses varied greatly according to species type and country. The most common responding actor was police, about half the time, followed by other government officials. This includes anti poaching units and park rangers, customs being the third type. In Mozambique, for example, police were the most responding actor, while in Zimbabwe it was other government officials such as park office rangers. In the majority of incidents, responding actor was recorded on acting on behalf of a special investigative mission. This is instances where the coders were asked to determine whether a special mission was re recorded or this was part of operation such and such, or whether this was just normal police routine checks or services. It was, always re it was also really interesting to see how much violence towards people, of course, um, was involved. By and large, incidents did not involve violence against the perpetrating actors. However, of the incidents that did, incidents that did Zimbabwe topped the list in terms of um, officials most likely to employ violence against poachers. The majority of incidents involved the arrest of the actor and the seizure of the contraband, and about a third of all incidents involved some form of litigation or appearances in court. A finding that may be surprising given popular perception is that nas of the nationalities of the actors involved, particularly the perpetrating actors. The top men nationalities mentioned for perpetrating actors were South Africa first, Chinese, Zimbabwe, and Vietnamese. Nationalities of actors were only mentioned about 9% of the time in the reporting, most frequently in South Africa and Zimbabwe. The reported market value of different commodities also greatly varied, with ranges as low as $200 for a product up to $1 million US dollars. Rhino, horn, and elephant tusk, unsurprisingly, were associated with some of the more higher values. 
With respect to media sources, African news was the most widely quoted source across the range of countries. Within South Africa, the most dominant sources were the Mercury, the Herald, and the Daily News, while the Herald was the dominant source in Zimbabwe. There's, of course, this is recorded across all countries, and I'm just giving a highlight here. In terms of international news wires, Xinhua, AFP, and Associated Press were the most frequent sources. Outside of South Africa, where of course foreign correspondents dominate, the countries with the most foreign press coverage were Zimbabwe, Mozambique, and Zambia. So with that, let's stop to, for a moment to discuss what the implications of studying something like this through media monitoring. First, we all like to think of the media as objective, but of course we have to recognize the reporting is limited through, through the respective of their sources and often influenced by media bias, limited by their freedom, and more often than that by funding constraints. These results must therefore be interpreted with respect to the verifiability and the limitations of the methodology. As we all know, South Africa's well-developed and open culture of print media means that far more reliable content was able to be sourced in South Africa than any of its neighbors. This is true even though the coverage is concentrated in the major cities and even less so in the northern provinces where poaching uh, is concentrated. Nonetheless, South Africa's robust media provides evidence that media monitoring can provide more fruitful results in the countries with open press. We were able to gain interesting insight into the nature of state response, how the media handles organized crime in Southern Africa, and the significant role of the individual in a set of activities all too often discussed and described as highly organized. Let's now consider how we might verify results. But it's first important to note that in doing this, the type of information gleaned from the media is categorically different from national crime statistics and the qualitative research. For example, there's a much wider window for interpretation of a crime incident by the media than by a government departments, who typically follow a set of procedures. Meaning, a police officer is a clear set of criteria for what categorizes a crime organized, while our research must interpret how a journalist interpreted an incident, if that makes sense. Further, smaller media houses in Southern Africa cannot carry out investigations to the same extent as organizations such as Trafficked or the Environmental Investigations Agency, who lead in-depth studies into the nature of markets and actors. Some innovative ways we are considering verifying the results include cross-checking incidents that involve litigation with records from the national prosecuting authorities, and confirming data trends with expert interviews and qualitative reporting. Methods to improve the quantity and quality of source material for the next phases include incorporating social media analysis and website scraping. So what does this mean for the fight against poaching? Firstly, focusing exclusively on poaching and smuggling is more likely to produce security-based responses when a much more comprehensive approach is needed to understand de demand dynamics, how poachers are recruited, and how organized crime actually operates. Without increased research efforts towards these dynamics, we will not be able to get at the root causes driving the crisis, and we will fall victim to generalizations and business-as-usual approaches. Law enforcement bodies and other government officials need to invest in better recording of incidents and data sharing. Media could be a tool to better understand organized crime in Africa, but it, media houses in Africa need significantly more support and training to increase their capacity to report effectively on such difficult and illegal activities.